uh, the spirit and life in the spirit and minding the things of the spirit. But tonight we spend the whole class on talking about more about what it means to mind the things of the spirit because this is so critical to the rest of the class. If you miss this point, you might as well not be in here. <coughs> um, not that anybody would, but uh, this is or this is the hinge pin for everything else that we talk about. So let's begin with a prayer. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, previously on the black <laughs> Romans chapter 7 and chapter 7 and 8, as you'll recall, we talked about the battle that goes on within the Christian chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. And without the conciliatory work of Jesus, we would be left in despair, as Paul leaves us in verse 24. But because of our deliverance by Jesus, emphasize that it is because of our deliverance by Jesus, there is now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You remember that from chapter 8 and verse 1. And so that's where we pick up here as we begin to read in verses 1 through 3. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For some of your translations will continue that sentence a little longer. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, because of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law, you realize the law has a righteous requirement, right? If you transgress law, you're sunk. Law requires perfect obedience. An infraction with regard to any part of the law sets one at deference from the one who made the law, or from whatever government, or from whatever uh, code, um, company code, or whatever else, when you make an infraction, it creates a separation between the standard and where you are. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. The righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. How is the righteous requirement of the law fulfilled? Why it's fulfilled in us, <coughs> who are we? We who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Do you see how critical this is to reconciliation with God? This walking according to the spirit and not according to the flesh? This is the hinge pin, as I said, of this whole class. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And previously we said the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in those who walk according to the Spirit, verse 4, and they are those who mind the things of the Spirit, verse 5. Okay? As... Ben pointed out while he was here, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, says it this way, and I think he's talking about exactly the same thing. He says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, <coughs> and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection. Are these things we can practice? Anybody scared of anything you see here? Self-control. Self-control. That's a tough one, isn't it? 
It is for me. Okay. But these are the things we're called to practice. Now again, he didn't say, get everything right. Don't make any mistakes. He said, make every effort to supplement faith with, vir faith with virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, I think this is key, some translations say, and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. So what's the enemy here? Ineffectiveness and unfruitfulness. Aren't we so, isn't that the way Jesus said we would know? those who are right by the fruits that they bear. So the enemy here is unfruitfulness. What happens if you're not fruitful? Well, the vine dresser prunes off that which is unfruitful and casts it into the fire. So this is perfectly consistent with the teaching of Jesus. The enemy is ineffectiveness and unfruitfulness. And how do you become ineffective and unfruitful? When you don't give attention to these things. It doesn't say that if you don't have them all mastered perfectly, I mean, who can master these perfectly? Who can master brother, brotherly love perfectly? Who can be perfectly steadfast or perfectly self-controlled? Anybody? Raise your hand. Debbie's not alone, is she? All right. Self-control is a tough one. All right. How do you get there? Well, you start with faith. You add to your faith. Virtue. It says virtue here. This is a kind of a Greek concept for excellence in what you're designed for. So a virtuous pocket knife is one that's sharp and sturdy. Okay? And so they would apply the word virtuous to a pocket knife if the pocket knife did what it was supposed to do the way it was supposed to do it. Okay? We're Christians. So if we're virtuous, it's because we're doing what we're supposed to do the way we're supposed to do it. Anybody perfect, perfected that yet? No. And he doesn't require that. He's not saying that. God never gives us, give, gives us excuses for sinning, and he doesn't ever say sinning is okay. He sets the standard very high, and what makes up the difference between where I am and where I want to be, where I'm striving to be? Grace and mercy. Grace, Grace and mercy, and justification by faith. It's a faith that you have that drives you toward that perfection that will gain you grace and mercy. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm skipping a verse now. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Confirm your calling and election. Remember the, how uneasy we were when we were talking about trying to live according to perfection and not even knowing what perfection was and not quite being able to get there and being afraid that we're in and out of our relationship with God and how terrifying that is. Look what he says here. He's given us some confidence in all this. He says, confirm your calling and election for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Now, isn't that comforting? To know that if you focus your mind on these things and practice them, and if they're increasing in you, you will never fall. Isn't that so different from the terrifying picture we laid out the last time? For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In which way? In practicing these things. Is that any different from minding the things of the Spirit? See, I think Peter's teaching exactly the same thing that Paul taught in Romans chapter 8. I think that's what this is all about. And, I, and this is not rare teaching in the Scripture. James teaches the same thing in James chapter 3. Um, you can go to any book in the New Testament and find this same emphasis on development of moral character knowing that we're not ever going to attain to the perfect picture of Christ, but that by grace and by what the work that Jesus did on the cross and by our persistence in trying to develop this and maintain this relationship with God, 
we will never fall. And that entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord, <clears throat> Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly, abundantly provided for us. I think we ought to be most grateful and take a deep sigh of relief that God doesn't require exactly out of us, I shouldn't say it doesn't require, that God is merciful enough <clears throat> to allow us to maintain a relationship with him without the perfection of Christ because of the perfection of Christ. Darrell? Yes, sir. That's all based on my faith in the Lord. It is. It, faith was the starting point of all that, wasn't it? And it's the starting point in Romans. We, we started reading in chapter 7, but you don't have to go back any further than chapter 4 and 5 to see the same picture laid out, how that it all begins with a foundation of faith. So when I struggle with faith, I'm going to struggle with these other things. That's, that's true, and I think it, that... It's, it's also true that we're going to struggle with these things. We are going to struggle with these things because our, our faith is not perfect. So what we're called on to do is to begin by insisting on having a, a um, on building ourselves up in the faith. And these other things then we add as we develop our relationship with Christ. So by this view... Let's take another look at Christianity and what is Christianity after all. What is Christianity by this view? Keeping the faith. Keeping the faith. Keeping the faith. And building on the faith. Maintaining faith. Okay, so I had faith. And I was baptized. That's great. That's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. Now you cultivate that relationship. You strengthen that faith. You pass that faith along to others. Christianity, by this view, I heard somebody else about to say something. Who else was talking? Maybe I imagined it. Is to walk according to the Spirit, minding the things of the Spirit. And you'll hear me say that until you're tired of it, I'm sure. 2 Peter chapter 1, increasing in these qualities. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, walking by faith and not by sight. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Consistent throughout the entire New Testament beginning with the teachings of Jesus. Christianity is a renewed focus on a different set of values than those that are possessed by those of the world and different from the ones you possessed before you were a Christian. You're seeking a different kind of value. It's a value that may not appear to people of the world. It's developing a relationship with God in the spirit. And I think these are all functional. In the end, these are all equivalent to each other. Because when one happens, the others happen. Developing a relationship with God in the spirit. Christianity is battling against the desires of the flesh. Sometimes winning sometimes losing. But not denying our sins, not rec but recognizing and humbly confessing them, calling a sin a sin. Basically, you're saying the same thing that God says about that thing. God says it's a sin, you say it's not. Who's the liar? God says it's a sin, you say it's a sin, Humbly confess it before God. And 1 John chapter 1 says, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all iniquity. Why? Because we have a propitiation, propitiation with the Lord. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Not despairing 
or feeling hopeless because of our struggle or our losses. There will be some losses, but we don't need to feel hopeless because of those losses, <coughs> Debbie, and we don't need to despair. Why? Because Jesus is fighting that battle for us, and his grace and mercy will make up for our failings. Your job is to focus on your faith and to build these virtues, build on these virtues, and your relationship with God that's before you. So keep your eyes ahead. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on moving ahead. And an entrance into the eternal kingdom will be abundantly provided for you. Jay. I think there's a, there's a foundational point here that uh, we often miss. We talk about the faith versus our faith. I think we confuse those. Yes, I think you're right. We're not, we're not, uh, my faith needs to be in the Lord. And as I have my faith in Him, and as I seek Him, I learn these things that are foundational for living in Christ. But when I look at the faith, that I have to keep the faith, that's where we stumble. Okay. Yeah, so there is the there are these two senses in which the word faith is used in the New Testament. Um, Jude um, speaks of contending earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints. He's talking about a body of belief, right? He's talking about a belief system that was delivered by the apostles through the Holy Spirit. That's what we're to defend. But when we're talking about my faith, we're talking about something different, aren't we? We're not talking about this body of belief anymore. We're talking about a personal relationship between me and Jesus Christ that's based upon my belief is an element of faith, but biblically described, it's belief in God and trust, implicit trust that goes with that, that causes us to act differently than we would otherwise have acted. Hebrews chapter 11, how do you know that all those people had faith? Because one by one he says, this one had faith. How do you know he had faith? By what he did. Noah, the faith of Noah. Noah, by faith, built an ark. Abraham, by faith, left his country. So this faith, this biblical faith, is a belief, but it's such a trust, in, implicit trust in God that it causes you to change the way you would act to, to ways that might appear to the world to be irrational. Leaving your home that you've always, not even knowing where you're going because you're looking for a city that has foundations, whose ruler and maker is God. You don't know where it is. All you know is God said go. And so Abraham did what? He left. Well, think about the, 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 uh, the situation between Abraham and Isaac when God told him to sacrifice. Can you imagine? <clears throat> this is why Abraham is the father of the faithful. Because of the marvelous demonstration of his faith and his willingness to act by even willing, being willing to sacrifice his own son, <coughs> believing that God had the power to raise him even from the dead if God chose to do so. And so he didn't question, he just did it. Kind of amazing. It is amazing. It really is because, well, y'all know what I've lost a child. Yes. Um, I can't imagine double any greater love. Well, it, I, I can't. Even, I can't put it into <laughs> we words. We get it. It's, just, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. The love that he had for for the father and the, the faith that he had in him to do what he he wanted him to do. Yeah. <clears throat> That's probably more meaningful to you than it could ever be to us. Y'all have no idea. Well, some of you might. That's why I'm half crazy, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you were crazy before that. <laughs> <laughs> now look. <laughs> I was a fun chick. Debbie, you know I'm not. <laughs> I love you too. No, I wasn't crazy back then. I'm just <laughs> So, how does a person develop this relationship with God? Or... How does one mind the things of the Spirit? Isn't that kind of important as a next question to answer? I have passed out to you, yeah, Ian. Can I, can I make the point that Absolutely. The, in what you're talking about, the stories of faith of those people in the Old Testament, that their faith led them to do things in the world that were big, 
Um, and uh, it, it, I kind of wrestle with this because I don't think that, some, that faith necessarily means you're going to be somebody important or great or something like that. But uh, it meant taking real actions. And uh, like I've heard, you know, I've, you, some of you have probably heard this. I've, you hear someone say, oh, so-and-so is a faithful Christian. He's at church every Sunday. And there probably were Israelites back in the day who were at the temple every time they were supposed to be at the temple. Or they were at the synagogues every time they were supposed to be at the synagogues. But the people of faith, David loved being in the temple. But the actions that we remember David for look quite different than that. And uh, I don't know. It's just something I think about and wrestle with that what faith actually looks like, what it's supposed to look like is probably different for each person, but it is action, it's supposed to look like action. Which makes it really wonderful that we have the examples of the failures of people like David and Abraham, because what that says to us is that people of great faith sometimes struggle with things and sometimes they fail. And it's those failures that allow us to connect with them and realize, you know, we're not all that different from them. And Ian says, faith does not necessarily mean you're going to do something great. On the other hand, what faith with a little bit of courage will do is it will enable you to do outsized things that you never thought you could do. Uh, so don't sell yourself short. Just because you seem to live a, uh, a rather mundane life, uh, you, you live your life in the background, Faith has the ability to do remarkable, uh, inexplicable things in ordinary people. And that's one of the great lessons from the Old Testament as well. You, you find that God always chooses the underdog. God always chooses the people who don't seem to be anything. David himself being one of those, the, the least of it in his father's house. The, the Gideon and his 300, I mean, just example after example after example of how people that would not otherwise draw your attention through faith and their connection with God were brought about extraordinary things. Um, so, as I say, don't sell yourself short. It is with cultivation of faith, we might surprise ourselves just what could be accomplished by the people in this room. So, wow, it doesn't mean that you failed just because you're not somebody famous. You're not Abraham, as I've said before, but you're not not Abraham because you're the child of Abraham and you have great potentialities through faith enacted with a little courage. Um, so, how do we do that? As I was saying, I handed out a, a, two handouts. These are things that are often referred to as the spiritual disciplines. Um, and these are somebody else's, is somebody else's list that I've modified. And it's nothing magical. You can find a hundred lists on the internet. I found a couple in it that I liked, and this is the one that I liked the best after I got done modifying it. You might find one that on the internet you like even better. You might have one of your own that you prefer over anything you'll hear here. But there are certain things that all of these lists will have in common. Um, this one's divided into two parts. The first one are, is the first part are disciplines of abstinence. And I think you'll understand quickly what I mean. The first one is solitude, so you're abstaining from interaction with other people for a period of time. And if you, uh, some of these you, you might say, well, is that really a biblical concept? So I put one scripture in a case where that might be, where it might come into question whether this is biblical or not. I put one biblical example, not that I couldn't have put 10 others for any one of these. But I put one biblical example to show you how the Bible might apply this particular discipline, where it might come from, how it might be connected back to Scripture. And if I saw on the list one that I had a really hard time connecting back to Scripture, I said, I'll just take that one out. Um, so these are all ones that I think connect solidly to Scripture. 
Sometimes you need to go to your mountain apart, like Jesus did. So you can commune with the Father, like Elijah did. Remember that one? Elijah in the cave? That's where he made it, where he reconnected with God and when he was living his life in, <clears throat> in fear and his faith seemed to be failing. Okay? Um, silence. Be still and know that I'm God. Understand how that could improve your connection back to God? People go off to, to, in solitude. See, all these are connected, solitude and silence. You go off in solitude, you don't have a lot of people to talk to. I talk to myself, but... <laughs> um, so those two go together. Fasting. Esther, remember the story there. She called on her maidens, and they called a fast on the behalf of the children of Israel for their deliverance from imminent existential danger. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. Um, why, why would he do that? Well, I can think of a number of reasons he might do that. To demonstrate mastery over his flesh? Why did anybody fast in the Bible? Well, it was very often, as it was in the case of Esther, sort of drawing God's attention to a plight uh, in this case, Jesus was starting a new mission. So he's got calling God's attention to his new mission as when those um, elders were appointed in the book of Acts and when Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas were sent out into the um, Gentile world, it was all initiated through fasting. So there might be any number of reasons why this might be beneficial, but I tell you, people who fast will be very quick to tell you that it really does connect you to God in a way that's almost inexplicable. Yeah, um, we don't do that much. Well, I don't really know of any. Some of us do it more than others, and part of the point of all that is that you're not supposed to tell everybody yeah. <laughs> when you're fasting. Yeah. So you may be surrounded by a number of people who actually fast quite a bit, and you would never know it. That's hopefully the way that that would be. If we're not doing that once in a while, um, as a as a um, way of reconnecting with God, you're probably missing something that would be really valuable to you. Now, I'm not trying to set up a, a standard. Um, you know, that's what the Pharisees did. They set up these standards that other hoops that other people had to jump through in order to be considered righteous, like they considered themselves to be righteous. Um, but I'm just saying you might be robbing yourself of something if you're not doing that. Um, secrecy, and this is, in this case, the way that it's used biblically in Matthew chapter 6, several times, it's the opposite of self-adulation. You're fasting in secret, you're praying in secret, you're giving alms in secret, not to bring attention to yourself. Sometime, if you haven't done this lately, to remind yourself of how important this is, do something for someone without letting anybody else know that you did it. And see how different that makes you feel than doing something that brings attention to yourself or something that everybody knows about. Just do something secretly that the person that you're doing it for doesn't even know where it came from. You ever had <coughs> that happen to you? Something just showed up on your doorstep one day, something just happened to you, you have no idea why it happened, you're thankful that it happened. You wish you knew who to thank. There's so many times there's been things put on our porch and I have no idea who did it. Like fresh vegetables from somebody's garden. Isn't that great? All the time, doesn't it? <laughs> Isn't that great? And you, you wish you could thank somebody for it, but that person is doing it not so that, they, so that they'll be extolled, but so that God will be glorified. And so you'll have a gift. You'll be blessed by it. Submission. Romans 13, Titus chapter 3, verse 1, <coughs> submitting, um, where it's appropriate. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 talks about submitting to one another, and it gives a specific example of that with the relationship between the husband and wife. Wives submit to the husband, husbands love the wives. 
Um, so again, this is something that you're depriving yourself of, which in this case is control, and yielding to someone else so that you will gain a spiritual benefit from it. Is there any spiritual benefit in submitting to someone else? Hard to see sometimes, especially when we're proud. But there is some spiritual benefit to yielding to someone else, even when it's not necessary. The others I call disciplines of engagement. And they include Bible reading and meditation. I can't talk about one of these without talking about the other. I don't just like to think of reading the Bible in isolation because so much is implied by reading the Bible, right? Reading the Bible is not very beneficial as a discipline if that word doesn't sink into you. And the word sinking into you wouldn't be very meaningful if you never draw that up and meditate on it. It never produces any fruit in your life. So reading the Bible is just the beginning of a process by which people are transformed. So, you see someone who's being transformed by the Word of God. It may be that, like those people who lived a thousand years ago where there were no Bibles, would sit and listen to the Bible read to them, and then they would try to retain as much of that as they could so that they could go out and practice it. How much better is that than somebody who pours over the Bible and it doesn't bring about any fruit of change in their life? Oh, they checked a box. They applied the discipline. But if it doesn't bear fruit in the life of the person who hears the word, then that in and of itself is not very valuable. So I like to talk about reading the Bible, but I like to talk about it in context of all the things that are supposed to happen when you do that. Praise, reverence, and I put worship in quotes for a reason. There are about seven different words in Hebrew that are translated as seven different words in Greek that are translated as one word in English, <coughs> worship. So that means a range of things, depending on what word is being used, the context that it's being used in, and uh, what it's supposed to produce in us. Uh, I gave a lesson one time some years ago about, about worship, and it was centered in uh, Genesis chapter 28, the servant of Abraham, who several times during the course of this story comes to a greater knowledge or appreciation of who God is, and as a result, he's called, to fall, he's called it, it causes him to fall on his face and worship God. That's the, the sense of the most common word that's used for worship. It's prostration, literally. It doesn't have to be prostration of the whole body. It can be just prostration of the heart. You can worship in a way that's not visible to anybody else, but the idea is still basically the same. I realize now that God is different than what I thought he was. God is bigger than I thought he was. God is stronger than I thought he was. And the result of that is I fall on my face. That's worship, okay? There are other words for worship in the New Testament. One has more to do with temple worship. Different word in Hebrew, different word in Greek, different idea altogether. And it has to do with the sort of menial service that's done by the priests at the altar when they're attending to the altar and you bring a sacrifice it sacrifice in, you're a worshiper because you brought the sacrifice in. But see, that's very different from the falling on your face kind of worship, isn't it? Then there's another kind of worship that's basically adoration. Uh, Lydia was a worshiper of God, okay? Lydia was someone who adored God. Lydia was someone who is deeply changed by God. That's that idea of worship. So lots of different things. And there are some of these things that you can, that you can practice as a discipline, probably not the first one so much. I mean, how do, you, how do you bottle that up and sell it, right? This idea of falling on your face. You don't just go in your closet and fall on your face uh, three times a day and call that worship. No, that's, that becomes something different. That kind of worship is, is something that's completely motivated by an upwelling from the heart. But there are th things that we can call worship, praise, reverence, these sorts of things can be practiced and we should practice them. 
because it enriches our relationship to God when we adore Him and when we tell Him how much we adore Him. We think about how, how wonderful and how marvelous He is. That, that's what changes us. That's the discipline that changes us. Of course, you can't have a list like this without talking about prayer. I think it's helpful to talk about interpersonal engagement. And the scripture that I mentioned here is confessing your sins one to another. You can't do that. You don't just walk up to people and start confessing your sins to them. Unless you're a kook. <laughs> um, I'm teasing about that. But really, if you're going to bear your soul to somebody, it's going to be somebody that you have a connection with. It's somebody you know. It's somebody you trust enough to make yourself vulnerable to them. And so there's something here for everybody. There's something for the person who needs to trust in other people. And there's something for the person who needs to be trustworthy. Who needs not to be judgmental and looking to point the finger at someone else. Because who's going to confess their sins to anybody like that, right? So we need to be the kind of people that people can come to. And we need to be the kind of people that go to them and are willing to engage them on that level. That's just one example of the ways that engaging with other Christians at a heart level can help to strengthen us in the spirit. Personal reflection and mindfulness. Uh, not all that different from the reading, meditation, letting the word soak into your heart and changing your perspective. Personal reflection comes from understanding your relationship with God Comparing yourself to where you are in that relationship and wanting to improve. And you, you can't do that unless you spend some time thinking about it. You can't just amble your way through life doing the things of the flesh without ever really taking time to consider your relationship with God. And that's best done in light of solitude and um, quietness, right? Those are the sorts of things that help us to be mindful and to reflect, to be introspective. And finally, service. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. I come to see this part of the Sermon on the Mount as talking about the primary um, goal of this part of the Sermon on the Mount is transformation. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its flavor... Wherewith shall it, I think he's talking about the food, be salted, made salty. How can, how can the food taste like salt if the salt has lost its flavor? We are the flavor of God in the world. We're the flavor of God in the world. We're the ones that bring flavor to it. What flavor? the flavor that connects us back to the Father. People will recognize the glory of God through the things that we do. And he goes on to say, you're the city that's set on a hill. Um, and I won't spend much more time on, on that. You get the picture. Jerusalem was a city set up on a hill. They should have been a light to all the communities around them. They should have been the ones that everybody looked to to see the glory of God. They failed in that. Jesus said, you're the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth, and by your good works, he goes on to use the word, the, the phrase, and I put that in quotes, because that's what he says in Matthew chapter 5, 16, so that others may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He's talking about serving other people. <coughs> the, way you're a, the way that you're salt and light to the rest of the community around you because you serve them. And people see your service to them and they say, wow, I want some of that. Where do you get that? Connects it back to God. People see your good works. You glorify your God, Father which is in heaven. You, you see, are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. How is that light seen? How is that salt tasted? Through the things that you're doing. So service is one of these disciplines that enriches our relationship with God and demonstrates our relationship to God with the people, to the people around us. Isaac? To that last point, I have in the past kind of stopped off at thinking about service as 
a way to bring people to God, you know, evangelism, if you want to use that word. <clears throat> but uh, in talking with some people recently, it occurred to me, yes, that is a big part of why we do this, but it seems as though God purely, or another reason that he might want us to serve the people of the world is because he loves them. He doesn't just want to bring them to himself so that he can bless them. He wants us to bless I'm kind of doing a bad job explaining no, this. No, I think you're right on. Because I've talked to Christians who are sometimes, you know, you know when, when we marvel at how much God has done for us. And for me, you know, like I said, my, my tendency is to think he's doing that to prove that he exists to me. But I think sometimes what I miss is he made me to be like him. I am his child. Whether or not I have yet been, you know, whether or not I have come to know him, he still made me in his image. And so there, you know, if I'm his child, he wants to do good to me. And so I think, I think keeping in mind that doing good for people for the sake of doing good to them I think, that, I think that has a place because then when God does that to me, it's easier for me to notice that, and that will help my relationship with him as well. It's not just that there's a place for that. That's the purpose of it. Right. If it's bringing the flavor of God to the world, when you do good for somebody, you have flavored the world. That's an, old, that's an end within itself. Maybe that person will someday, because of what has happened, will be changed. But how, how different is that than if all of us blitz Bowling Green with the good things that we can do for other people, and then Bowling Green has changed. I've known of communities, entire communities in China that have been transformed by one person who became a Christian who suddenly decided, okay, the streets are just way too dirty, and we're just not, people are just not kind to each other, and she changed, and people around her changed until the whole community was transformed by one person, Jamie. I think too, along with that, we're not even talking yet about the change that happens in us when we're doing that. Yes, and yes, yes it changes all these people. Even if, even if they don't come to know Christ, the good is still done to them yes. <clears throat> and the good that is part of my sanctification is denying myself and serving another so there's just no downside really yeah. it's good all the way around very good great okay what will it not look like <laughs> this this um idea that we're talking about of christianity i got one minute some portion of one minute Walking in darkness, failing to recognize sin in one's own life, giving up on the struggle, running away from God rather than toward Him, cutting off communion with God because of sin. You know anybody that's done that? Rationalizing sin to make it look acceptable, the appearance of perfection or the self-delusion of it. The appearance, this, this is so pharisaical, you see what I'm saying here? That the Pharisees thought they were the image of perfection. And because of that self-delusion, they, they put the grace of Christ out of reach. They put the grace of God out of reach. We're 15 seconds over time. Haven't heard the bell yet. <laughs> Thank you all for your participation and your rapt attention. Thank you very much.